Hello, hello, and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. It's Howard Bachner, editor in chief of JAMA. And I'm here once again with Tony Fauci, who I think at this point needs no introduction. Tony, I think you're pretty well known to everyone in the United States at this point. Well, uh, for better or worse, that's probably the case. Huh? Well, from my standpoint, and I think all of medicine, certainly for the better. So, Tony, yesterday uh, I had a chance to talk with Paul Offit, who talked a bit about vaccines for about 30, 35 minutes. I would just like to spend five or ten uh, minutes uh, on uh, the vaccine question and where we are. Uh, just before we came on, you mentioned that uh, phase three trial will start in July. Could you talk a little bit about what that will look like? Yeah, well, what it's going to be is a randomized placebo controlled trial of 30,000 individuals in in the first of the candidates, which is the Moderna uh, mRNA that was developed uh, at the NIH in the Vaccine Research Center. It's now done its phase one study. The company started the beginning of a phase two study uh, literally a few days ago, and we're preparing the sites now for the phase three study, which are both international and national sites, predominantly national, but with some international sites. So there'll be 30,000 people in the trial. It's going to be a big trial because we want to get as many data points as we possibly can. And then very soon thereafter, or possibly even simultaneously, Howard, the AstraZeneca uh, 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 candidate that was developed in the UK, it's a chimp ad uh, done at Oxford. That's going to be very closely aligned with the study I just mentioned. And then some of the other studies are going to start maybe one to two months later as you get towards the end of the summer. So there's an array of at least four and possibly five trials that I am aware of and directly or indirectly involved in, either in the development of it or in providing some of the clinical support for the sites that are being used to do the actual clinical trial. Tony, uh, the Moderna Phase 2, uh, how large is that and what will be learned from the Phase 2 before, yeah. before we get to the Phase 3 in July? It'll be a few hundred. It's going to be predominantly a, you know, a safety and more immunogenicity study. But the real, uh, the real you know, uh, business end of this all is going to be the Phase 3 that starts in the first week in July, hopefully. Tony, how long does that have to last to know if there's effectiveness? Because we've talked about this before. People in the control group need to see disease, as do people in the in the in the vaccinated group. Um, I, I'm assuming thirty thousand is based upon some estimates, but do you accrue data as the study goes along to know if those individuals are seeing enough disease? Yeah. So the issue is, it isn't the duration of the trial. It's if the trial happens to be in a situation where there are a lot of infections. Right. So right. so if you go in and you have dribs and drabs of infection, even though you have 30,000 people in the combination of placebo and experimental, it could take months and months and months and months to get an answer. If you start the phase three, and then when you're a month or two into it, you happen to get in an area that you highly vaccinated, where you've had a big outburst of a surge of cases, you could get your answer pretty quickly. Will there be... Uh, uh age, sex, race, ethnicity, diversity amongst the 30,000, or will it be focused on healthy, uh, younger individuals? Well, it will be both. It will be predominantly 15 to a, a, uh, excuse me, 18 to 55, but there also will be those who are elderly and those who have conditions that are uh, underlying and comorbidities. So it's going to be uh, the entire spectrum, actually. Are you optimistic, Tony? I mean, you know, you wrote a, a viewpoint for us a few years ago about the acceleration in vaccine development. I don't think at that point even you saw the pandemic coming. No. Uh, this particular pandemic and, and, and would be able to move to a phase three trial in six months. Right. Are, are you optimistic, Tony? You know, I'm cautiously optimistic that with the multiple uh, candidates that we have with different platforms, that we're gonna have a vaccine that shows a degree of efficacy that would make it deploy deployable. The reason I think so is that, you know, one makes a pretty good immune response against this coronavirus. The overwhelming majority of people recover. Obviously, 
the deaths, even though they're profound for this outbreak, over 105,000 deaths so far, still the majority of people make an immune response, which clears the virus, which tells us that if the body is capable of making an immune response to clear the virus and natural infection, that's a pretty good proof of concept to say that you're going to make an immune response in response to a vaccine. However, having said that, as you know, Howard, mm. there's never a guarantee ever that you're going to get an effective vaccine. I'm concerned a little bit more about what the durability of response than I am about whether you're going to get a protective response. Because if you look at the duration of protection, when you recover from one of the several benign coronaviruses that cause the common cold, the durability of, of protection is only measured, you know, in a year or less, as opposed to some of the other infections where you could have 10, 15, 20 year degree of protection. Tony, if you, if we get to the fall and there's a good vaccine candidate, you get to September or October, you and I've talked about this before, 30,000 doses isn't, 10 million doses or 20 million doses or 50 million doses. What, what happens with the production of that candidate vaccine? Well, Howard, that's what's going on right now that's very unique in vaccine development because we and the companies and the federal government predominantly is doing this at risk. And what at risk means, not at risk to the patient for safety, not at risk for the scientific integrity. It means at risk for the investment. So we're going to start manufacturing doses of the vaccines way before we even know that the vaccine works. So that by the end of the year, the prediction of the statistical analysis and the projection of cases indicate that we may know whether it's effective, efficacious or not by maybe November, December, which means that by that time, we hopefully would have close to 100 million doses. And by the beginning of 2021, we hope to have a couple of hundred million doses. So it isn't as if we're going to make the vaccine show it's effective and then have to wait a year to rev up to millions and millions and millions of doses. That's going to be done as we're testing the vaccine. That's what means at risk. Tony, we'll come back to vaccines. There's so many questions, as is often the case. Uh, I think you always a, a, a attract a certain group of people who just want knowledge because of who you are. But I, there were some other questions that had already come in. Um, monoclonal antibodies. You've written about this before. Um, can you see a role uh, uh, for monoclonal antibodies as, as we try to sort out schools and colleges protecting the elderly, nursing home people? Yeah. Right now, we have a major push on a program to develop monoclonal antibodies, as well as convalescent plasma, as well as hyperimmune globulin, all of which are founded on the same principle of using an antibody that is directed against the virus for either prophylaxis or treatment. And I think you're going to see it's going to be for both. So one of the things that we'd like to do is get available for those who are at risk, the elderly and those with underlying conditions, either monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma. That's a very, very high priority, Howard. And for convalescent plasma, uh, like in New York City, the seropositivity rate is somewhere around 15 or 20 percent, means almost a million people have been infected with the virus. So there should be sufficient convalescent plasma available. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I, people I know have lined up, they've been generally quite generous with uh, yes, providing we're, it. We're, we're counting on that. We're actually counting on that. Uh, a couple other things have uh, uh, come up. Uh, as is often the case, people always raise the issue about vitamin D um, and, and whether or not it could be helpful in treatment. Uh, I have said, given the number of randomized clinical trials that have been conducted and reported over the last year, it has not been a good year for vitamin D in, in the sense that almost none of the clinical trials uh, have supported the observational data about relationships between vitamin D and various outcomes. Do you have a sense of vitamin D and its role with COVID-19, Tony? 
You know, Howard, I think it really relates to the situation that sometimes confuses people when you hear reports of the importance of vitamin D in host defense against infection. There's no doubt that if you are vitamin D deficient, that in fact, you might have a poorer outcome or a greater chance of getting into trouble with an infection. What people get confused at is that most people in the developed world are not vitamin D deficient. So adding additional vitamin D may not actually have a substantial clinical effect of helping you, but that doesn't uh, undermine or lessen the importance of a normal level of vitamin D. So, I mean, in some of the developed countries, developing countries, there have been studies with tuberculosis and other diseases that those who are vitamin deficient, including vitamin D and vitamin A also, that they do worse. Whereas if you get the vitamin level normal, then you're in good shape. Uh, n numerous reports on uh, chloroquine and, and uh, you know, John has published it, some of the other leading journals. Let's put that aside for the time being. But azithromycin has come up repeatedly. And the question uh, about zinc and azithromycin, do you have a sense, you know, some people have said, well, the reason azithromycin isn't working is because you're not combining it with zinc. I don't know the data that well. I'm not sure uh, uh, if, if there's much uh, of a basis for that argument. Do you have a sense of zinc and azithromycin? I don't think there's enough data at all, Howard, to give you any firm conclusion as to the benefit of azithromycin alone versus the benefit of azithromycin plus zinc. There's anecdotal stuff all over the place, as you well know. Yeah. There, there are studies now that are looking at a combination of, of, uh, of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin compared to a placebo to see if there's any effect there. That's what we need, as you well know, and you and I have both said that many times. Yeah, no, both yeah. you and I are strong believers in a randomized clinical trial. <laughs> right, and unfortunately, there's a paucity of that. Yeah. Tony, it's been a difficult week for the uh, for the United States. The, 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 the death of, of Mr. Floyd has been painful. But below that is the ongoing pandemic, and... Right. Uh, you know, the death of Mr. Floyd has clearly uh, moved the pandemic to below the fold in many of the newspapers, uh, right. rightfully so. Do you, the most recent data, you know, states have opened up uh, more aggressively and less aggressively, uh, variable amounts of time. Uh, you have expressed concerns in the past about uh, mid to large side gatherings. I remember your response when someone said, do you mean 25 people or 10 people? And you simply said, I mean, keep them to limited amounts of people. Do you have a sense of what's happening in the states that have opened up early a and whether or not there's been more or an increase in disease that is of great concern? Well, there's been a great deal of variability in the states in their opening. Some have leapfrogged over the benchmarks, you know, the uh, gateway, the phase one, the phase two. And we've seen pictures, photos, and TV uh, clips of people very much congregated, no masks together, very closely congregated on a boardwalk, on a beach, in a pool. That has been and continues to be a concern to me. We're not going to know what the effect of that is for at least a couple of more weeks, because in order to determine whether a particular behavioral change has an effect on the incidence of a particular infection, like the coronavirus, it likely is three weeks or more. So we're only a week and a half to two into that, so we need to wait and see. Uh, numerous questions. Immunity passports. Tony, Zeke, Emmanuel, and, and I chatted about it. Uh, he thinks they're coming. Do you have a sense of immunity passports? You know, an immunity passport, I think, would be an appropriate thing, possibly, possibly, if we knew how long the duration of antibody protection was and whether or not a certain titer does or does not protect. I think if someone is infected and they're antibody positive, uh, there is not a lot of data to say how well protected they are against reinfection. And given the fact that coronaviruses in general 
have a durability of infection that is not measured in multiple years, I think there's a lot of questions about the utility of immunity passports. I'm not ruling it out, Howard. There's a possibility that we'll be using them, but it's not a perfect solution to what the question is. Tony, can we get to a way in which the schools open in, in the fall? It's yeah. it's become a huge. It's going to become a huge issue. I I I worry about the decisions that mayors and governors are going to have to make in the fall. But it's it's 55 million children. We published a viewpoint today about it. Can we get to a place where we can open the schools? Yes, I I think we can, Howard. But we've got to remember that something that sort of is the underlying denominator of everything we talk about when we talk about. Uh, coronavirus in the United States. We have a very large country. It's a diversified country. The difference between the New York metropolitan area and Casper, Wyoming, the difference between New Orleans and uh, Des Moines, Iowa is very different, particularly when you have many, many counties that in certain areas of the country where there's almost no infection at all. Under those circumstances, I think it's much, much more easy to make a decision about opening the schools. If you're in an area that has a considerable degree of active ongoing infection, you might have to make a tough decision. It may be either delay or do a modified schooling. And modified, if you really want to be creative, you could do it in a lot of ways. You can do something as as distant as online teaching or teaching morning question versus afternoon session with different cohorts in each, with a much, much diminished crowded. You could have the seats further apart. You could do outdoor to a certain degree. I think to say, can we get the schools open in the fall? Well, it depends on where in the United States you are. What is the status of infections in the region you are? So the answer is yes for some and caution for others. Tony, anything new on a asymptomatic carriage spread, PCR testing, that always comes up repeatedly. You know, someone's PCR positive, then they get well. How long are they potentially infectious for, you know, their PCR lingers to be positive for a week or two? Is there anything new that's crossed your desk? No, but let's just review <laughs> for, for the listeners very quickly. So, you know, the percentage of asymptomatic carriers was first felt to be just a few percent, less than five. The more experience we have, we know it's much more than that. It's more likely 25, and in some estimates, even as high as 50%. It's always problematic when people recover and you have the PCR to determine if they're infected and you don't have replication-competent virus that you can culture because it isn't easy to do that as opposed to just doing a PCR amplification. We know for sure that when people recover, they may be positive for PCR for you know days and days and days, even though they're not infected. What we're doing is we're starting to get a feel that it depends on the cycle threshold. If you have a cycle threshold, which means how many times mm -hmm. it takes you to do the PCR cycle to get a positive hit, if it's 35 or more, even though it's technically pos positive, the chances of that being replication competent are extremely low. So in other words, you could have a PCR positive and yet still not be contagious. IgG, IgM, most people developing it? Yeah, they are, but the titers really, really vary. I mean, I have examples of people who clearly were infected who are anybody negative. Like, what's going on here? Why are they anybody negative? But they are. They probably have such a low titer of antibody, it's below the level of the cutoff. And then there are others that have very robust antibody responses. I, I, it's a very interesting situation. It isn't a uniformly robust antibody response, which may be a reason why, Howard, when you look at the history of coronaviruses, the common coronaviruses that cause the common cold, the reports in the literature are that the durability of immunity that's protective ranges from three to six months to almost always less than a year. That's not a lot of durability of protection. 
Yeah, that's your comment about the vaccine, and you were you mentioned you weren't quite sure about the durability of the vaccine. Now, it may be completely different with this coronavirus, with the SARS-CoV-2. It may be that they induce a response that's quite durable. We don't know. But if it acts like other common virus, common coronaviruses, it likely is not going to be a very, very long duration of immunity. Tony, I, I know it's been a long day for you, but I, I always at the end ask you a, a more personal question. A very close friend of yours last week passed away, Larry Kramer. Yeah. Um, I saw some quotes, but I really wanted to hear from you, not quotes. Uh, you had a very interesting personal and public relationship with him over many years. You, you and I have chatted about it. It wasn't always yeah. the same in public as it was in person. Can you say say a bit about Larry? You know, he was a um, truly an iconic figure uh, in that he did something that transformed the way we act with regard to the community of people who are at risk or who have a disease and the so-called authorities that are responsible for the science, the clinical trials, the regulation, and the government oversight. He demanded a seat at the table, beginning with the very early years of HIV AIDS. And it was at a time when there was a degree of rigidity in the government, that scientists are right, everybody else needs to listen to them. The regulators are right, everybody needs to listen to them. Well, in order to get the attention, he became extremely iconoclastic and very abrasive and very outlandish. I, as at the time, back in the 80s, mm. was the face of the federal government with HIV. So he decided he was going to viciously attack me, call me a murderer, call me incompetent, call me the enemy. So that was the beginning of our relationship. <laughs> so it started off very adversarial, but then I think I did something that I, I'm, I'm sort of proud that I did, is that I said, let me listen and, and see if I can empathize with what's going on, not only with Larry, but with the entire activist community. So we went, I, I reached out to him and I said, I mean, I gotta get to know this guy who thinks I'm a murderer. So I reached out to him and we went from being adversaries that were significant. I was never an adversary to him. He was very adversarial towards me. Um, bad adversaries, not so bad adversaries, acquaintances, friends, good friends, really, really good friends to the point that, you know, we kind of loved each other because I wound up take, helping to take care of him uh, when he got seriously ill. I arranged for his liver transplant. Um, the thing about Larry that was so unique, I'll give you two anecdotes. One is what people say about him. He's the only guy that we know who can enter into an argument where there are two sides of the argument and succeed in alienating everybody <laughs> on both sides of the argument because of how abrasive he was. But he had a heart of gold and he was a beautiful man. He really was a beautiful guy. I mean, we, those who really know him, on the one hand, were put off by his craziness. On the other hand, loved him. The other thing is that he had this capability of even though at a time in our relationship was after maybe 20 years of knowing each other, we were very, very close. But he still used the opportunity to publicly criticize me right. as representative of the federal government, that even when we were in the middle of a warm part of our friendship, give you an example. I had had dinner with him like a week before he came down to Washington, he grew up in Washington. He went to Wilson High School. And he came down for a reunion or something like that. And we had dinner. We had a great time together. We was talking and drinking and laughing and all that. Came over the house. Then we went out to a restaurant. Then a week later, Ted Koppel on Nightline invites us to be on the show together. So I thought we would have like a warm kind of relationship. He gets on the show and he starts saying, Tony Fauci, you're a disgrace. <laughs> you're an embarrassment. You're not doing enough. You're terrible. You're just a government shill. 
And I'm sitting there saying, what the, <laughs> what's going on? So at the end of the show, he was in New York, piped in, because the show was filmed from Washington. So I just got in a cab and went home, and I got home like 10 minutes later, because I live in downtown Washington. So I got in, I walk in the door, about 10 minutes later, he gets on the phone, and he says, hey, Tony, that was great, wasn't it? <laughs> you did wonderful. And I said, Larry, you just trashed me in front of 10 million people. <laughs> what do you mean it was wonderful? He says, oh, no, but we made our point. Right. We made our point. So that was the way he was. I mean, he was an amazing guy who was totally devoted to the welfare and the good of the gay community. I mean, he was the strongest advocate. And when a disease afflicted them that he felt people weren't doing enough about, that's when he unleashed all his fury. Uh, last question, Tony. Your equanimity, you, you went to Holy Cross. It's a, it's a Jesuit school. Yeah. Does it come from your parents? Does it come from your Jesuit education? It's extraordinary under the face of just remarkable criticisms, often unfair, yeah. almost always unfair. Yeah. Well, I think it does come a lot from my parents. My father was very much of a, of a tolerant person who would you know, accept people for what they are and very rarely ever criticized anybody. Um, I went to a Jesuit high school too, G Regis High School, which right. was really the beginning of the experience. It's, a, it's a, an amazing high school in New York City, in Manhattan. And from there I went to a Jesuit college, Holy Cross. And it was the, the, I think it was just right for me because I had always been somebody interested in public service and not being somebody that ever attacks anybody, that accepts them for who they are and what they are. And that kind of culture of service to others uh, was very much the theme of that kind of training. So it just, it was kind of the perfect atmosphere to me to be educated in. And I just carried it along with me. So uh, that's how I react to attacks. I always try to find out What's the underlying reason why they're attacking me? And with the gay community in the early years of AIDS activism is because they were hurting and, and they, they had a government that didn't care about them. This is Howard Bachner, editor-in-chief of JAMA. I've been, I've been here with Tony Fauci. Uh, people know who he is. I just think of him as a national treasure. Tony, thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Howard. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with you. It's, it's my privilege.